tonight, what I want to do is I don't want to talk about the entire book. Um, you know, I want to try to sort of lay out a couple themes um, that I think are important that I enjoyed researching um, and that I think you uh, might find interesting to hear about. And then I want to leave, you know, of course, plenty of time to talk, hear your thoughts, um, you know, feel free to push back on anything I say tonight. Um, we can talk about other aspects of the book as well. Of course, if I was with you, uh, I would have brought books with me. I know some of, uh, some of you certainly would have perhaps wanted a, a signed copy, uh, but I do sell, I only will do this once, I promise. I, I do sell uh, the book directly. And so you can see um, the website address, cwmemory.com. If you go there, you'll see a link on the top for books and you'll see the book and you can click on the, the red link and it'll take you to a page where, um, where you can get a personalized copy. I've got them here and I'm, I'm happy to, to send them out. The book is, uh, has been out for about a year and, um, and has, uh, has done quite well, which obviously I'm you know, uh, thankful for. Um, but it's also a controversial topic. And I think many of you, uh, you know, at some point in time probably came across this sort of black confederate narrative. Um, you know, you can find it on hundreds, if not thousands of websites out there. Uh, if you Google black confederates, uh, you'll find images like this, you'll find all kinds of primary sources uh, that appear to, um, to, to demonstrate that the confederacy mobilized um, anywhere between 500 and 100,000 uh, black men as soldiers, as bona fide confederate soldiers serving in uh, what many people claim were integrated regiments, obviously in contrast with uh, the United States Army, which of course recruited into uh, segregated units uh, by 1863. Um, that, that narrative is, uh, as I argue in this book, is a myth. Um, it's, a, it's a myth that first appears uh, in its present form in the 1970s. And so I try to do two things with this book project. The most important thing, or what I started out trying to do, was to debunk the myth itself, just to show why the myth uh, is false. But I soon realized that, that that wasn't enough, that I would also need to, to talk about uh, the roles that African Americans played during the war years itself. And so the book is roughly divided in half between uh, sort of how Confederates, real Confederates, uh, mobilized African-Americans, how they experienced African-Americans in a wartime setting uh, during the war, even decades after the war. And then in the last few decades, how those stories eventually evolved into this modern myth, this black Confederate myth. And so I wanna start, I guess my, what I really wanna do tonight is give you enough information uh, that you can understand that if, you were to travel back in time, or if we were to have a Confederate come back, uh, you know, to jump forward in time, and if you were to talk about with that individual black Confederate soldiers, they would have looked at you or will, would look at you dumbfounded. They would have no frame of reference to understand what you are talking about. Because as far as real Confederates were concerned, there were no black Confederates. And so that's the point that I want to drive home tonight. I'll, if we have time, we can talk about the, the myth making itself in the last few decades. But I want to talk about the war years and the first few decades after the war itself. And I want to start with this iconic image from uh, the Civil War itself. Many of you have seen this photograph. Um, it's, a it's in the hands of the Library of Congress right now. And for many people, it is the clearest evidence that the Confederacy at least mobilized one black soldier, the man on the right. Um, again, you can find this on hundreds of websites. It's obviously the cover of the book itself. Um, it shows two men. Uh, on the left, you can see Andrew Chandler, and on the right, our right, you can see Silas Chandler. They both are wearing Confederate uniforms, and they both appear to be armed to the teeth. I mean, anywhere you can place a weapon, you've got a weapon. And so again, you can see why this might convince people that we are looking, uh, in fact, at a Confederate soldier. However, it doesn't take much research to learn that really what we're looking at is a photograph of the master-slave relationship at war. 
In fact, what we are looking at is a master and slave. Silas was born into the Chandler family in 1839 when they lived in Virginia. Uh, when he was very young, two, three years old, the family moved to West Point, Mississippi. And between roughly 18, the early 1840s and 1860, the family accumulated um, a number of enslaved people, Silas being one of them. Um, Andrew, of course, on the left, you can see very young. By 1860, he's about uh, 17, 18 years old. Silas is uh, 23, 24 years old. And this photograph um, was likely taken at the very beginning of the war. Probably as they were leaving West Point, Mississippi, uh, they entered a studio and had this photograph taken. And you know, the more you look at it, um, I think you have to sort of, you know, at some point start chuckling as I now do, because uh, when I look at this photograph, what I see is a young white Southern man eager to go off to war, eager to demonstrate his bravery, his Southern honor to his family back home, what better way to demonstrate this than to take a photograph with his body servant, with an enslaved man that many Confederates, especially Confederate officers, brought with them into the army to serve as servants, right? You can imagine the responsibilities of officers. These enslaved men were attached to them as body servants, or what I call in the book, camp slaves. I use that term camp slave uh, to, de to make sure that there's no question about the legal status of men like Silas Chandler. And the reason I chuckle is because I can imagine Andrew walking into the studio all bright eyed, again, wanting to demonstrate his bravery, walking into the studio, seeing weapons displayed on the side of the studio, or perhaps in a corner. And then as they are seated, trying one by one to fit in another weapon to drive home the point that he is in fact a brave Southern boy about to go off to war. And so this to me is, is sort of a bizarre photograph. It's highly unusual because it's the only photograph that we have of master and slave uh, where they are seated together like this and both armed. Um, it is very likely that the weapons themselves are simply studio props. And the uniform that Silas is wearing, the artillerist jacket may also be in fact a studio prop. Although as you will see, um, camp slaves or body servants uh, quite often acquired uniforms or parts of uniforms uh, once the war started, once they were in camp. But there would have been thousands of these men in the Confederate Army functioning as body servants. Uh, again, accompanying Confederate officers from the slaveholding class. And it's part of a larger mobilization of enslaved men by the Confederacy very early in the war. I don't need to impress or to tell any of you uh, that the Confederacy, of course, lacks uh, in any number of categories compared to the United States, both war material, um, you know, in terms of factories, all of that. But of course, population-wise, they are also at a huge disadvantage with the North uh, numbering roughly 19 million and the white population of the South somewhere around 4.55 million. So if the Confederacy is gonna have any chance at all of gaining its independence, it's gonna to have to mobilize as many enslaved men as possible. So in addition to the many camp slaves that are present in the Confederate army, the Confederacy also mobilizes tens of thousands of impressed slaves to do all kinds of things for the Confederacy during the war. As you can see here, impressed slaves on James Island, uh, South Carolina, constructing earthworks. Uh, they would have constructed earthworks all across the Confederacy, and that would have freed up a large number of white men or more white men to shoulder a rifle in the army itself. But you would have found enslaved men uh, in factories, places like the Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. They would have maintained and repaired rail lines throughout the Confederacy, anything the Confederacy needed to advance its war effort, impressed slaves or enslaved men would have been uh, rounded up to work on, right? And this happens from the very beginning of the war until the very end, the last days of the war itself. And so the mobilization of black bodies is absolutely essential 
to, to, the, to the Confederacy having any opportunity or, get, or chance of gaining its independence. At no point at the beginning of the war is anyone seriously considering the mobilization of, of enslaved men as soldiers. Why would they? As many of you know, the Confederacy is very clear at the very beginning of the war, and indeed throughout the war, that what they were fighting for was the maintenance or the continuation of the institution of slavery and white supremacy. The goal of the, of the Confederacy was to protect the institution and even spread slavery if they have the opportunity uh, at some point during the war or perhaps after the war, after it's gained its independence. And so I want you to imagine, again, I want you to imagine thousands of enslaved men attached to Confederate armies from 1861 to 1865, many of them, of course, functioning as camp slaves or body servants. And here, of course, is another example uh, of the camp slave, of the body servant here uh, with a Georgia regiment, 57th Georgia, not quite sure what year. Uh, but again, in addition to these men, there would have been, again, thousands of enslaved men, not just camp slaves, but other enslaved men detailed to do all kinds of jobs with the army itself. Uh, they would have been teamster driving, uh, driving trucks. They would have worked in hospitals. Uh, they would have been um, maintaining supply lines for the armies, uh, you know, as they marched from place to place, working as blacksmiths. Again, any kind of job that, that uh, served as the, as the sort of foundation uh, or what the armies needed, uh, enslaved men would have been um, sort of uh, forced to do those to do those jobs. One of the things I tried to do uh, with these uh, early first two chapters of the book was explore the relationship between these camp slaves and their masters. This is a much more common uh, photograph uh, compared to the, the first one that I showed you. Uh, this is more common, enslaved man in a uniform posing next to the Confederate officer, in this case, Lieutenant J. Wallace Comer of a 57th Alabama Regiment. And what I was very interested in was trying to explore the relationship specifically between these two men, between master and slave. I think, you know, for many of us, we think of the master-slave relationship in the context of the plantation back home. But, what I, but one of the things I was curious about was what happens when you pluck that relationship out of the home front and place it into a very different environment, an environment that neither party was familiar with, right? Um, Comer, Burrell, neither of them had ever experienced war. How would the war impact that relationship? Um, how would uh, Comer manage his slave at war? Would Burrell push back on Comer's authority at different points? Would he ask for more privileges? Would he take more license to, um, to do certain things that perhaps he wouldn't do back home on the plantation? How would that relationship um, stretch and contract at different points? And I found that it did in, in many ways. And sometimes I found that the relationship was severed entirely. Quite often, uh, slaves like Burrell ran off to the Union Army uh, or the Union Navy if it was patrolling um, close offshore in places like South Carolina along the seacoast islands. And so understanding that relationship was sort of the uh, the goal of those early, the first two chapters um, of the book. You know, interestingly enough, you know, I found that in some respects, being at war together brought them closer together. Now, I want to be very careful here. Uh, I am not suggesting in any way that these two, these two individuals that you see in front of you were friends. I think to describe, you know, a friendship uh, between master and slave, between someone, um, you know, who owns the other person, uh, is simply to misunderstand what we commonly uh, refer to as a friendship. But certainly these men both experienced um, various privations. Both of them experienced um, you know, being away from loved ones. They experienced foul weather. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, enslaved men also experienced the dangers of the battlefield itself. And so I found that, and of course, perhaps the best example is sickness. Uh, plenty of examples of master and slave at different points 
uh, coming down with uh, with some kind of virus or flu or what have you, and the and one being forced to care for the other, uh, and so you find uh, that these relations relationships were were quite complex. You also find examples where masters have to exert their authority on their camp slaves, on their body servants. Uh, in one case, I found a Confederate officer who wrote home to his wife describing in excruciating detail having to lay on, in his words, 400 lashes on his enslaved man for stealing food at one point during the war. And so again, very complex relationships. But I wanna make one point very clear, and this was sort of a revelation for me in the course of my research, because I think, you know, if I were to ask all of you tonight to imagine in your own, um, imagine for a moment, uh, what Robert E. Lee's army looked like, uh, let's say in the summer of 1863, as it's marching north out of Virginia into Maryland, eventually into Pennsylvania, and to imagine it stretched out, let's say roughly 75,000 men. If I asked you what that army looked like, uh, more than likely you, will be, you, are, you are imagining an army of white men, right? Um, and as I was studying this, um, the subject, specifically the, the, the role of enslaved men in the army, it occurred to me that Confederate armies were armies of slaves. Robert E. Lee's army in the summer of 1863 may have numbered anywhere between 10 and 15,000 enslaved men. Think about that for a moment, right? You have your camp slaves, your body servants that I've been talking about. You have thousands of impressed slaves, again, doing all kinds of other uh, jobs for the army. Again, teamsters, hospital attendants, again, all, a, a wide range of, of roles. And it drives home the point, I think, uh, that enslaved men were, in Alexander Stevens's words, the vice president of the Confederacy, the cornerstone of every Confederate army. Confederate armies could not have functioned without the presence of enslaved men. And I think that's important to acknowledge. It's certainly important to acknowledge when we think about something like the Gettysburg Campaign. Uh, because as many of you know, as Lee's army moved into Pennsylvania, his army kidnapped upwards of 200 in, uh, free blacks in South Central Pennsylvania, in Gettysburg itself. Uh, this uh, woodcut, this Harper's, I should say, lithograph from, from Harper's Weekly is from 1862, but it details one of many um, slave hunts that the Confederate armies engaged in throughout the war. And Robert e. Lee's army in the summer of 63 certainly did engage in something like this as it moved into Pennsylvania, something I think we all too often forget. But let's also imagine that that army numbered somewhere between 10 and 15,000 enslaved men. I think that gives us a very different picture of the history of slavery as it relates to the army itself, because I think we all too often are willing to acknowledge that, that the Confederacy was engaged in protecting the institution of slavery, but we're not really focused much at all on the ways in which the Confederate army was involved in preserving directly the institution of slavery, right? That in a sense, the Confederate army was made up of that institution itself, right? And that every Confederate soldier, whether he owned zero slaves or a hundred slaves, would have understood the crucial role that enslaved men were playing in the army itself. Again, I don't think Lee's army could have effectively camped. It could not have effectively marched from place to place. And it certainly could not have effectively fought in battle, engaged in battle without the presence of enslaved men. They are the backbone of the Confederate army itself. And again, I think what's, what's important to remember here is that throughout much of the war, there is very, very little talk about recruiting black men as soldiers. Uh, in fact, when Northern newspapers are reporting that the Confederacy is enlisting black men as soldiers, Confederates steadfastly deny this, actually insulted by the very suggestion. Uh, they think it's dishonorable, right? Because of course they understood 
that recruiting slaves as soldiers would have undercut the very purpose of the Confederacy itself. Uh, if slaves can be soldiers, uh, then what exactly are they fighting for, right? What, 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 what does the, the, the sort of inequality of the races mean if slaves can fight just as effectively as white men, right? It collapses that difference or that distinction. But by 1864, uh, I think for many Confederates, they're beginning to see the writing on the wall. They're beginning to see that without recruiting black men, uh, that defeat is looming ahead, right? And so throughout much of 1864 and early 65, Confederates engage in a very public, a very divisive debate over that very question, whether they should recruit black men as soldiers. And here uh, is a, another, another uh, sort of Northern cartoon poking fun at the very idea of the debate in the South, suggesting that the moment Confederates make black men soldiers, they are going to immediately run over to the Union lines. Uh, so this is a reflection of that debate in the Confederacy during this period. Um, what's fascinating to me as someone who has researched this topic uh, over, you know, over the period of 10 plus years, and as someone who has dealt with you know, people uh, who believe that large numbers of um, black men fought as Confederates uh, at different times during the war, what is absolutely striking to me is that you will not find a single wartime account during this period, during this intense public debate that takes place in the army. Soldiers are debating this. Entire regiments are issuing statements on whether they approve of the recruitment of, of slaves as soldiers. The Confederate Congress is debating it. Newspapers are publishing editorial after editorial. And of course, you have to imagine that throughout the Confederate home front, they're debating this. I have yet to find a single account, wartime account from this period, from anyone in this debate, for or against, who says, by the way, black men are already fighting in the war. It doesn't exist. I once offered a monetary award on my blog for anyone who could come up with a single wartime reference acknowledging that black men before 64 were already fighting as soldiers. As far as Confederates were concerned, this was still a white man's army, okay? So I think that's really important to, to acknowledge. Um, it's not until March of 1865, the middle of March, the Confederate Congress barely passed legislation allowing for the enlistment of black men as soldiers. Um, a s very small number were recruited in Richmond. They were housed in a prison, which gives you a sense of how much they were trusted. Uh, there's no evidence they were really armed. They may have paraded down Broad Street in Richmond once or twice. Uh, they certainly did get a little bit of newspaper coverage. But of course, the war ends by the beginning of April, and that's that. There is no evidence at all that any of these men uh, experienced the battlefield. So for Confederates, the war ended as it began, right? As a white man's war. And I think that makes perfect sense given the broader historical context of what the Confederacy was fighting for. And what's interesting is that for decades after the war, white Southerners, Confederate veterans who experienced the war itself and others, for decades, never made the mistake of believing that there were black soldiers in the Confederate army. It just did not come up. Um, and so, you know, what's interesting is to explore the post-war period and the ways in which these black men were remembered, these camp slaves, like the images that I showed you just a moment ago, because they remain part of the Confederate lost cause, that narrative that sort of takes shape after the war, that justifies the war from a Confederate perspective, that helps them explain the pains of defeat. Uh, the war was still just in their minds. Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson remained Christian warriors, upright moral leaders, and of course, the Confederacy wasn't fighting for slavery as it claimed during the war itself. They were fighting for a constitutional principle, states' rights, uh, as we say. But they also maintain that their slave population remained loyal. And so throughout these, uh, the, the sort of post-war period, they're not talking about Black Confederate soldiers. They are talking about their former body servants, their loyal slaves who remained loyal to the cause and loyal to their masters. And you can see this throughout 
the post-war period. In lithographs like this, uh, popular prints, Stonewall Jackson in camp, you can see the young boy who would have served as Jackson's uh, body servant to his right. You can see this very peaceful pastoral scene. Uh, Jackson's uh, officers standing there uh, using their swords as, uh, as, as a sort of instruments of prayer. Uh, and it highlights that lost cause theme, uh, sort of the religious aspect of the Confederacy, but also that theme of the loyal slave that you see here. Uh, here's another image, right? And you can see the camp slave sort of lounging by the, uh, by the tent, uh, closer to your view. And then in the background, you can see, of course, three enslaved men, uh, or I should say perhaps one or two, one, one man, perhaps two women, uh, per, uh, likely cooking in the background there. And again, you can see in the, the way in which white Southerners remembered the presence of black men in the Confederate army and black women, not as soldiers, but as, as servants, as enslaved people. And again, this, this is a common theme throughout the post-war period. You will read about loyal slaves uh, in Confederate memoirs, um, you know, in, in publications like Battles and Leaders, um, you know, anything that's being published uh, about the war, that theme is present. That loyal slave uh, theme is very much present. And it's present right through the, the beginnings of, of the sort of popular Confederate reunions uh, that take place, the veterans reunions that take place, uh, you know, in the 1870s, in the 1880s, and, and so on. And it was very common to see former camp slaves or body servants present at these uh, reunions. And I, I discussed this quite a bit. I think it's one of the more fascinating aspects of, of this subject, uh, because many of these men uh, are present at multiple veterans reunions. And one of the best examples is this man here, Steve uh, Eberhardt Perry uh, from Georgia. He attended anywhere between 12 and 15 reunions, extremely popular. And what's interesting about Perry is he appears to understand the role uh, that he was supposed to play at these reunions. White Southerners uh, expected these men to play the role of the loyal slave, but they also expected them to uphold um, white supremacy. They, they, they expected them to acknowledge uh, the racial status quo of the post-war period. So we're talking about coming out of Reconstruction, White Southerners are regaining control of their state governments. They're reimposing white supremacy throughout the former Confederacy. And these reunions offered Confederates an opportunity, obviously, to remember the war itself. But the presence of these men also signaled uh, to Black Southerners the kinds of behavior or expectations uh, or the expectations of the Black community. And so for Eberhardt, you know, he would constantly make speeches talking about being, quote unquote, quote unquote, and excuse the language, the white man's N-word, right? He understood uh, that he should say things that support the Democratic Party in public, denounce the Republican Party during these public events. And by doing so, he kind of reaffirmed for white Southerners that the racial status quo was justified, that black Southerners understood their place in this reconstituted um, society. And it also sent a very powerful message to young black Southerners who did not experience slavery, did not experience the war, who were pushing for civil rights in the post-war South. These men were, were in a way symbolizing the way all black people should behave. Don't cause trouble, be deferential to white authority, and know your place. Again, know your place in this racial status quo, in this reconstituted um, Jim Crow society. This is Jefferson Shields. Again, you can see, if you look close up, uh, another individual who was president at, president at numerous uh, veterans reunions. You can, see his, um, you can see his pins, his veterans pins that he would have... Uh, uh, would have been given at, uh, at each ceremony. But they were, they entertained large white crowds at these reunions. Uh, there would have been thousands of white Southerners who flocked to these national reunions. And these men were to entertain them. They were there to play a role. Some of them, I think, were there to earn money. 
um, in their moments of entertainment, um, certainly in, this, in their storytelling. Certainly some of these men traveled with local Confederate veterans uh, to perhaps secure their own place back home. Perhaps they were looking for certain favors back home. And by traveling with these men, local veterans to these national reunions, they had demonstrated their loyalty um, to the Confederacy, to their old masters, and obviously would have acknowledged their place in the local communities themselves. Um, here's another shot, uh, again, from a, a veterans gathering. When you see these photographs, quite often you'll see the black men um, sort of positioned just to the side. Right, not exactly as part of uh, the event itself. More than likely, uh, they would have functioned as uh, as servants, even excuse me, at, at these events as well. Uh, this next image is really one of the more interesting ones, uh, and you'll find this on on hundreds of websites as uh, evidence of black soldiers. They some of these men appear to be wearing parts of their uniforms. You can see Steve Eberhardt to the left holding his Confederate flag really one of the most flamboyant, um, you know, former body servants uh, at, you know, who attended these events. He was best remembered, I have a photograph of him, I should have included it. Uh, he, he's photographed hold, holding two chickens under his arm, two live chickens. And the reason he did that, others did it as well, it was to demonstrate that they were effective uh, foragers during the war. So they were able to demonstrate that even during times of need, when food was scarce, they could still rustle up food for their masters and other Confederates in camp. But if you look two men to the right from Steve Eberhardt, you're going to see a man with a hat. Uh, he's, you can see a white pin or ribbon on his, uh, on his jacket. And uh, it's interesting because when you blow this image up, when you look closely at what it says, and maybe even you can pick it out if you look closely, it actually says ex-slave, right? So again, you know, for, for white Southerners uh, during this period, there was never any confusion as to the status of the black men who attended these Confederate veterans reunions. They were always remembered as loyal slaves. So again, the point I'm trying to drive home tonight is that real Confederates and white Southerners generally, for decades after the war, never heard of black Confederate soldiers, right? In fact, that very idea would have undercut everything they believe in, right? Uh, because during the war, as, we've already, as I've already mentioned, they were fighting to maintain white supremacy. And during the decades after the war, white Southerners are fighting to reconstitute white supremacy. So they don't want to remember black men fighting as equals with whites. They're going to remember black men who fought, or I should say not fought, but who were present as loyal slaves. And so that narrative is what fed white Southerners' understanding of themselves during this period, right? And for generations. Here's one more, I'm gonna keep going. Um, this is a fascinating uh, newspaper advertisement. It gives you a sense of how prevalent the, the sort of uh, loyal slave narrative was. This is from the New York Tribune in 1920 of all places. Um, you can see the, the, uh, they're trying to sell a new washing machine and guess who of course is selling the washing machine but none other than Robert E. Lee. But you can see of course to the side, you can see the body servant or the faithful slave cleaning his socks in the local creek. Right. So again, that loyal slave narrative um, was was very present during uh, the, the, the post-war period, and it's present in the monuments themselves. Right. Another thing that, of course, many of us uh, have on our minds of late, uh, and you can see that spike uh, between roughly 1890 and 1920, 1930. That's when the vast majority of these monuments go up throughout uh, the American South and even beyond. And the reason I mention this is because many of the monuments uh, that are being dedicated are being dedicated as part of that loyal slave narrative. And so one example, of course, is that even as late as the 1920s, the United States Senate was actually debating whether or not to dedicate a national Mammy monument on the National Mall in Washington, DC. I mean, imagine that for a moment. The Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, and the National Mammy Monument. 
So it gives you a sense of, of just the extent to which white Americans had embraced this memory of the war as including loyal slaves. Think of the power of that for a moment, right? Completely erased from memory are the stories of enslaved people who are actually running away during the war. Completely erased is the story of the roughly 200,000 black Americans who fought for the United States during the war. On the left, you can see uh, one of the proposals uh, by this man, USJ Dunbar. He actually submitted this to the state of Tennessee that considered you know, dedicating a monument uh, to the loyal slave after the U US Senate decided not to move forward. Uh, but that's his design model. That's perhaps what would have ended up on the National Mall in Washington, DC. But of course, we do have a National Mammy Monument roughly in Washington, DC. And it's just across the river in Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, this is a monument that was dedicated in 1914. President uh, Woodrow Wilson helped with the dedication address. Like many of these monuments, uh, it was organized by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And I want you to notice the children in this photograph because these monuments are not so much about the past as they are about the present and the future. They are about educating younger generations of white Southerners who did not experience the war, who did not experience what white Southerners believed to be the horror of Reconstruction. And this is an opportunity to remind them of their role in, up, uh, in maintaining white supremacy in the Jim Crow South. Uh, this monument sits in the center of Arlington National Cemetery. You can't miss it. It's the largest monument in the entire cemetery. It was designed by Moses Ezekiel, as was mentioned earlier, a VMI graduate. Um, and it sits at the center of roughly 365 Confederate graves. These are men who were disinterred uh, from area cemeteries around DC and reinterred in Arlington. It's a long story, but I want to sort of, um, and I'm gonna focus on the monument itself in a, in a second, but I wanna remind you that when you visit Arlington, you can't miss this monument. But if you wanna visit the black men who fought as United States soldiers buried in Arlington, you have to make it a point to know where to go. You have to go to section 27 of Arlington, which is in the far corner of Arlington National Cemetery. Very few visitors ever see those graves, ever have an opportunity to honor their sacrifice. But these men are honored in the, in the very center of Arlington National Cemetery. And it's the, the, the motifs around the monument itself that are controversial, because there, of course, to the right is the loyal mammy figure, taking the child from the Confederate officer, of course, saying to that officer, don't worry, your child is, is going to be well taken care of, perhaps better than my own children. And that reinforces the loyal slave monument, or the loyal slave narrative. To the left is the image of the loyal camp slave. You can see that black man in what appears to be a Confederate uniform. This monument is often mistaken for a monument that honors black Confederate soldiers. It doesn't do anything of the sort. In fact, all you have to do is look at the history of the monument that was published for this dedication by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And if you read toward the bottom, that individual is described as a faithful Negro body servant following his young master. For the, for the United Daughters of the Confederacy, for anyone who took part in this ceremony, there would have been no misunderstanding that they were looking at not a soldier, even though he's in uniform, but a slave, a loyal slave, right? Um, and one more, one more point about these monuments. We constantly hear today that removing Confederate monuments is tantamount to erasing history. What I want to impress on all of you tonight is that the very dedication of these monuments erased history. By mythologizing the war itself, these monuments basically erased an entire chapter of the Civil War because it was inconvenient to remember it. It would have undercut the very purpose that these monuments served, right? To announce the, the, a victory, if you will, to announce the reestablishment of white supremacy in the Jim Crow South. 
So I, we can talk about that further. I'm going to end in a few seconds here because uh, I, I want to give you guys a chance to ask questions and push back. Real fast, here's another faithful slave monument that may actually be removed in Fort Mill, South Carolina. I don't mind saying uh, or admitting tonight with all of you here, I do hope this monument is removed. Uh, it is a disgrace uh, because if you read, of course, the inscription here, uh, you can see, of course, this is how African Americans are remembered, simply as faithful slaves who toiled for their masters and the Confederacy, right? This is, uh, this is a monument that, again, erases history, pushes us further and further away from understanding the very history that many of us claim these monuments represent. They do nothing of the sort. They distort the very history itself. Unlike, of course, what the monument here in Boston does, right? Uh, one of the only Civil War monuments that actually acknowledges at this time, dedicated in 1897, that black men fought as soldiers, that they were brave, that they gave something of themselves, right? But this was a rarity during this point in time. There were no reminders of black service in the Civil War, in part because the landscape itself, the monument landscape in itself, was so uh, set on mythologizing the past or ignoring the presence of African Americans entirely. And I should just sort of point out that in many, of the, many parts of the South where these monuments are located, more than half of those counties, those populations, were African American. So the problem for many of these Confederate monuments is not simply that they don't represent the values of the community today in 2020. The problem in many parts of, of the South is that they never did, right? But of course, African Americans during this time did not have the ability to put up monuments to their own history. They, they were disfranchised, prevented from voting, and of course, intimidated, intimidated in other ways from taking part in that public discussion. Real fast, it's really the late 1970s that gives, um, that gives birth to this Black Confederate myth. It's actually in response to the success of the television series Roots, roughly in 1977, the book and, and, and the series, that for the Sons of Confederate Veterans was a warning. For the Sons of Confederate Veterans, they started worrying uh, that the story of black soldiers fighting for the Union, that a darker portrayal of the history of slavery would undercut their own preferred memory of the war. For many white Southerners, especially those who celebrate their Confederate heritage, they had for much of the 20th century been able to remember that past without dealing, having to deal with the history of slavery and white supremacy. But coming out of the civil rights movement, uh, you have local governments that are beginning to reflect more and more um, the diversity in their communities. Museums are beginning to address uh, a, a more accurate view of history. Um, more books are being published. Um, and more in terms of popular culture, we're seeing representations like this. Jump ahead to, of course, the end of the 1980s. Think of the impact of the movie Glory. Also think of the impact of uh, Ken Burns's Civil War documentary, much more focused on the history of slavery. And again, especially black soldiers, Union soldiers, that begins to force the Confederate heritage community to come up with their own black Confederate soldiers. And it doesn't really take hold until the advent of the internet. That's really when this myth begins to take hold. And we can talk about that a bit more in, in some detail uh, if you want. But I want to stop there because, uh, again, um, Zoom can be draining. And I do want to give you guys every opportunity to, uh, to sort of share your questions. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing just so we can all come back together. And I'll, I'm happy to share again if you want to, um, to go back and look at an image. But thank you very much for listening.